Wallach on Law examines criminal cases and criminal justice and asks the question, we are tough on crime, but is that helping? Can we be smarter and make us safer? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Ian Wallach is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles and New York. His cases have ranged from defense of the accused to prosecution of governments in their treatment of convicts. He's a former Los Angeles deputy public defender and a frequent contributor on legal issues to radio and television shows nationwide. You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! You need a bigger post this country. Our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. This is Wallach on Law. Here's your host, Ian Wallach. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you for checking in and joining us today. We have a very exciting show uh, set for it. We're going to be continuing our discussion of the conditions of L.A. County jails. This is international news. And for that, we, are, we plan to have some uh, absolutely incredible guests, and it's a very exciting show. Uh, Gloria Allred is scheduled to call in today. We understand there's been a minor bump. She might have to come on another week, but, uh, but we're going to see. Uh, actually, I do, we do hope she's going to call, and we welcome her when she does. She's a champion of civil rights and equality, and she has set her sights recently on L.A. County jails, and it's treatment of the mentally ill. We also are going to have Honorable Terry Smirling. We spoke about uh, Terry Smirling in our previous episode. Uh, this, this man uh, was ahead of the game in calling and basically asking uh, the, that we reconsider the way that we treat uh, mentally ill people who are caught up in L.A.'s criminal justice system. Now let's talk about the crisis at L.A. County jails. Uh, and I, I am a little bit biased in this regard. I represent indigent defendants in the county of Los Angeles. I'm a former public defender, and I currently get state-appointed cases. Now, what this means is that I get hired by the state to represent people who can't afford to hire a competent attorney on their own. And that makes up about 95% of the people who are caught up in the criminal justice system. All of my clients have been in L.A. County jails. L.A. County has the largest jail system in the USA. It houses over 22,000 people. Most of my clients have passed through one jail in particular called Men's Central Jail. Now, this is a jail. It is not a prison. And and here's the difference because it's crucial. Jails are operated by cities. They're intended to house low-level offenders, misdemeanor offenders, people awaiting trial. Prisons are state facilities that house serious offenders that we call felons. Now, Men's Central Jail, this this specific jail presently houses over 7,000 people, and that is far beyond capacity. 57% of these people are not convicted. Okay, they are, they are still presumed innocent. These are people awaiting trial. Why should we care about anyone caught up in this jail? Well, consider this. Let's say you have a drink on a Friday. Uh, You're driving home, and an officer thinks you might have driven while intoxicated, and you get arrested. And you can't put up a deed, and you can't can't fork out the $3,000 or $5,000 for bail. You might spend your weekend at Men's Central Jail, and longer if if the magistrate doesn't let you out later. And now we have a big problem in California prisons being overcrowded, so jails, like Men's Central Jail, house this overflow. You would spend that weekend with all levels of criminal offenders. Now, now I currently have clients who are asking for deals that allow them to get out of Men's Central Jail and go to prison. These are these are these are these are like tough guys. These are these are people who either have criminal convictions or are or, or facing substantial charges, and they're saying, "No, I don't want to be here in Men's Central. I feel more comfortable, safer in prison." The ACLU has been calling for the closure of Men's Central Jail for years. This year, Mother Jones Magazine listed Men's Central Jail as first in its list of the 10 worst jails in America. Now, the ACLU has been calling for its closure for years. Uh, in early June, the Department of Justice – and we're not talking about some you know, hippie left-wing organization. We're talking about the Department of Justice. They issue a report calling the conditions of Men's Central Jail deplorable and state that they, open quote, present – rather than prevent a risk of suicide. This became international news with the BBC stunned that this could happen in America, let alone in a major metropolitan city like Los Angeles. Now, the FBI was conducting a secret investigation into Men's Central Jail and inmate treatment, and as a result of this investigation, 21 Los Angeles County Sheriff's officers were indicted and are facing trial on charges of violating civil rights of inmates at Men's Central Jail. The FBI was doing a secret investigation into the jail. They were using inmates for informants. Deputies, sheriff's deputies found out that one inmate was an FBI informant. The FBI was coming in to extract him. 
these deputies, uh, per the allegations, but one person's already acknowledged them, they purposefully hid that inmate, changed computer records, changed his name, hid him from the FBI so they could interrogate him. That trial is going on now. How can the conditions of a low-level jail in a major metropolitan city be this terrible? And, and what needs to happen to bring about change? Now, uh, that, that DOJ report also talked primarily, in large part, about the conditions uh, for the mentally ill individuals who are housed there. And let's talk really quickly about the, the mind of the mentally ill. Now, these are people who, by definition, think differently, so we call them mentally ill. And since thought leads to action, they act differently. They act outside of societal norms. And acting outside of societal norms is what we call criminal behavior. So these, it, it's, these are not people necessarily associated with, with greed or, or aggression or d dishonesty, but, but for mentally Ill, th th these are mentally ill people. These are people who, who think differently, and, and they, they, they can't control their actions, and there are treatment facilities available that are successful alternatives to incarceration. And to talk about that, we're going we're to speak with Judge Terry Smerling. Now, Judge Smerling is, uh, is a member of, of the bar of, of the L.A. Superior Court. Uh, his opinions here are his own. They're not rep representative of, of any person or entity. Now, the Department of Justice called these conditions uh, deplorable, stating that they, that, that they have contributed to a rise in inmate suicides, uh, 15 in the past 30 months. And they say that they are uh, rat-infested, uh, vermin-infested, uh, and mental health treatment inside the prisons uh, is far from what is necessary. And a few days prior to the DOJ report, Judge Smerling wrote an opinion piece for the LA Times. And he talked about this current plan, he's gonna discuss it here a little more, to spend 2.3 billion, that's with a B, to build a large facility to house mentally ill uh, patients or inmates is completely unproductive. And he quoted, instead of spending large amounts on a better jail experience for them, we should spend money on local treatment programs that would keep low-risk offenders with mental illness out of jail. Uh, I am very, very pleased to have to the show to welcome to the show Judge Smerling. Judge Smerling, are you here? I am. I'm here. Oh, Judge Smerling, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I, I'd like to sort of begin with, with a, 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 a broader question, which is, you know, why should people care about you know, the well-being of, of, of mentally ill inmates? Well, that could be it could be anybody's relative. They're they're people that have the misfortune of suffering mental illness. There's a very high percentage of our population that suffers mental illness, and uh, and, and unfortunately, many of them end up incarcerated. Now, I, I might also add that largely the reason these people are in custody, uh, they've been arrested, is because they've either committed small thefts that, when when they accumulate over the years, can become felonies. Uh, or also that they've committed drug possession crimes because they're self-medicating. These are not heinous offenders. These are people that have committed fairly minor crimes, but they find themselves incarcerated. And it's it's, it's very well known uh, in psychiatry that the mentally ill fare far worse in, in custody than do uh, normal people. They deteriorate. And when you say when you say uh, f fare far worse, that means uh, I mean they deteriorate. The, their mental condition deteriorates. They they they, they become worse. Uh, and, and they, so their, their condition it, becomes aggravated. And if their condition becomes aggravated, and if their condition contributed to their conduct, it, it's fair to say, or I guess we could suggest that that, that we're actually making these people who don't who may, not, may or may not mean to be dangerous more dangerous by incarcerating them. Well, I'm, I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word dangerous, but I think it's more likely they're going to reoffend and uh, be uh, involved in our system again at enormous cost. I might add, uh, it's extremely expensive to lock somebody up, uh, especially somebody with a with a mental illness. And, it's also, and locking them up does nothing to uh, to uh, fix the problem. I mean, what they need is treatment. They need treatment out of custody for the most part. And by the way, the treatment is far less expensive than is incarceration. So to me, the, the current system is mindless. The idea of building 3,000 mental health beds in a new county jail is mindless. We don't need that many beds. We need well, what, what treatment is this? Blocks. You were commenting. You were commenting on a uh, on a proposal uh, to, to build. Uh, I guess it's part of a proposal to build a super a, a super prison. Do you uh, could you explain a little bit about about what this present movement is? What this idea is to fix the problem at Men's Central uh, as it relates to mental health. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the Board of Supervisors has been contemplating this problem of the Men's Central Jail for over 10 years, and just recently, within the last month or so, uh, they've approved 
uh, a plan to build a brand new enormous jail in the place of the Men Central Jail. And that enormous new jail would include uh, 3,000 beds for the mentally ill. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me. Let me. Uh, there's a good deal of our listeners uh, are not lawyers, and and I I, I want to talk a little bit about some just some nuts and bolts so people can understand the context a little bit. Uh, I know that people tend to get outraged when they hear that someone, for example, got probation or or, or diversion, but I don't think people really understand um, how pro- what probation is or, or or how it works or how it might even extend the time that the court has the power or the justice system has the power to, to monitor someone's behavior. Could you well, when someone's granted probation, it, it has teeth. It, 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 uh, it, uh, probation includes uh, conditions that the probationer, the defendant, must comply with. And for the mentally ill, those conditions typically are that they uh, be involved in mental health care. Okay. Uh, I, I, had a, I had a case, and I mean, it's done with, and I'll talk about it in the abstract, but I had a case where a mentally ill individual thought that, uh, that, that he was being chased by people, and, and, he ran, and he ran to a police station, and they said, listen, you, you're crazy, you're not being chased by anybody. So he ran for 20 blocks, and he thought he was being chased again, and he began to you know, bang on a door, bang on a door, bang on a door, uh, and, and he broke a window, and the people inside were, were really, really scared, and they said, we're going to call the police, and he said, no, don't call the police, they, 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 did, they, did, they didn't help. Now, you know, let's just take an abstract. Let's say he was looking at, you know, three years in jail as a potential sentence, uh, and, and a bench officer wanted to instead uh, try to affect his problem and, and put him on probation. What, what kind of terms could could you impose, and what kind of well, the probationary period could is would be typically three years. It could be as long as five years, and uh, the conditions of that probation would be that the person, you know, at, attend. Uh, you know, a mental health program that's being monitored uh, either by the departmental health or the probation department. Uh, uh, a, a bench officer should require, uh, you know, routine periodic progress reports, monthly, bi-monthly, uh, to make sure the person's complying. And uh, there's a lot of monitoring involved. You just you just don't sentence somebody and then forget about them. You watch them. And then what 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 happens? Let's say you put someone on probation. For you know three years, and they could have gone to jail for three years, and they're 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 you know they, they're two years and they're they're two years into it, and the person says, forget it, I'm not going to go, to, I'm not going to go to the doctor anymore, or, or they don't. What 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 could a, a judge then do? Well, the, the 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 judge could impose a state prison sentence because when you're put on probation, what what what's happening is the judge reserve is reserving the right to uh, impose state prison at a later date. So if a person violates probation, that person is risking uh, going to state prison. So in your hypothetical, that person can end going to state prison for three years. Exactly. So it seems to me as though if the option is send somebody for three years or, or put them on probation for, for three or five years under the, 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 with the, and then hold on to the capacity to, to incarcerate them if they, if they don't, you're actually extending the amount of time that the law enforcement system and the judicial system has over that person's conduct. I think that's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, it, once you send someone to prison, you've lost all control over them. Uh, they just do their time, and, and, and they, they leave custody and most likely reoffend. And, and um, according to the Department of Justice, it, it seems as though the conditions, especially for the, uh, the, the, the mentally ill, are going to aggregate their their aggravate their aggravate their condition. And so there would be yeah, I think that I think that's clearly the case, and it's also astounding, absolutely astounding, how many mentally ill people we have locked up in the in the county jail. Um, it, it's uh, what, what's become what I think what's happened is that we've criminalized uh, mental illness. That's not to say that all mentally ill people get arrested. Uh, they don't. I mean, it's, it's still a minority that get arrested and get in trouble with the criminal law. But to a large extent, we have criminalized mental health problems, and we're requiring the, the criminal justice system to deal with these problems when they're really best handled by the mental health system. And is, is, is that the result of a lack of, of, of advocacy, or, or do you think there might be a, you know, a public sentiment against, or do you know? I mean, I know it's not a legal I think question, it's, a, but... it's a lack of treatment. It's unfortunate, but uh, there is, is, a, is a definite lack of uh, mental health treatment available uh, to people who can't afford to pay for it. Now, maybe things will change gradually under Obamacare. Uh, that's in the process being formulated right now, where uh, the, the right to mental health care is being elevated uh, to the same level as uh, the right to physical health care. But for years... I, I have the impression... Sorry. 
Go, yeah, go ahead, go on. Well, I have the impression that that, that uh, Obamacare, I mean, and that's that, that's true, and that we're definitely making steps in the right direction. But the clients that I come into contact with who are afflicted with mental illness, they're not going to know how to, uh, you know, go to a place to log onto a computer or, or or even have the facilities in place to to get these benefits in the near future. They're probably going to be the last wave of people who are who are able to avail themselves. Um, well, I think that's that's correct. Yes, yes. So what often happens is a lot of the uh, I see different types of people. I see people that are mentally ill that really have never had any help, and they get themselves arrested, and lo and behold, they're put in contact with treatment. Uh, uh, others have a long history of being treated ineffectively, and um, we just keep trying. I mean, uh, it, it is very difficult to deal with people that have schizophrenia, especially people who won't take medications. Sure, and, and I guess that's what, where the sort of the moderating steps in. Um, can you talk about the, the other word that, that, that you know that we get to use a lot uh, in the court is diversion? Um, and I, I think when I try to explain that to people who uh, don't understand, uh, I saying, okay, well, you know, this client, you know, I, I want to get them a, you know, a diversion, and that they think that anything that that is not jail is perhaps not a sufficient uh, a punishment, and, and that may come in from a misunderstanding of what a diversion program is. Can, can you well, can you speak it, a little bit about? Well, I can. I can spend a diversion more generally. Is just the notion of diverting people out of the criminal justice system into into treatment, and that can involve putting people on probation, getting them out of jail, and in, in, into probation and treatment. For more specifically, uh, diversion in the legal sense can mean uh, giving someone treatment instead of prosecuting them. Um, for example, uh, first, first-time drug offenders can be diverted, meaning that instead of facing prosecution, they can com- commit a they can complete a, a treatment program and get the case dismissed. Uh, there are no diversion programs in place for the mentally ill currently. So there's there's, there's uh, official uh, or, or there's lawfully enacted diversion programs for for for, for first-time drug offenders, but you're saying there's no. Uh, and, and, I, and I believe that there's programs available for the developmentally disabled, That's you know, correct. people who correct. may have lower lower IQs. But there's there's none in place for people who may have a history of, of documented mental illness. None in a formal sense. Now, you know, uh, individual courts and prosecutors can come up with vehicles to, to accomplish this. Uh, in my court, from time to time, the, the DA sees someone who's mentally ill and decides that we'll have the person do treatment and drop the case. It does happen occasionally. More typically, though, what happens is the person pleads guilty, is put on probation, and then is provided treatment. Now, that latter scenario, in, in the loose sense, is diversion, but not in the legal sense. Let, let me uh, let, let me let me add to that because I, I think a lot, a lot of people don't understand that there's uh, there's two parts to a criminal conviction. There's usually uh, you know a, 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 a plea and a sentence. And an individual is, if he, please tell me if I'm correct, but an individual is not deemed convicted of a crime uh, until they're sentenced. Is that a fair? That's correct, and actually with drug diversion, people plead guilty, and then they're awaiting sentence. If they complete the drug program, the case is dismissed without their being sentenced. You're not you're not convicted until you've been sentenced. And people in, in the mental, legal sense. Okay, and and people who have uh, mental illness, they already because of you know the, the problems that they suffer, have a hard time getting employment. Uh, they have a hard time finding a place to live. Do you, would, would you agree with that? Or a harder. Oh, I, I agree, and 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 the, uh, the the mental health programs that are in place, uh, for example, some of them are called full service partnership FSP. Uh, they provide wraparound services for the mentally ill. They provide medication management, psychotherapy, job training, assistance with housing. Get these so people it, back on their feet. So it seems to be. So I think then then some of, one of the options. Let's take let's take we have a you know a mentally ill first time offender, uh, or, or who's brought in. You know maybe they're young. Maybe they've just gotten out. You know they've gotten out of juvie, so their prior conduct's not not you know considered to be to be criminal. They're out trying to get a job. They're trying. They're they're dealing with the personal uh, uh, afflictions that they have. The options are take them, incarcerate them, give them a criminal conviction, which would certainly harm their capacity to live a meaningful life uh, within society or uh, provide actual treatment for them. They could teach them how to get a job, how to get a place to live, and not saddle them with that, uh, with that conviction. Is, now that, is that, that an overgeneralization? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah it's, it just seems to be it's surprising that this is not statutory enacted to me. It, it seems to be such a more common sense decision, and it's also a cheaper decision as, as far as what it costs. Is that right? Well, well it, it's costly to prosecute somebody. It, it's certainly costly to incarcerate them. Uh, uh, treatment isn't free, but, it, but it's much cheaper uh, than incarceration, much cheaper, now, maybe a third now, of the cost. Uh, as I talk to, um, you know, as I try to uh, negotiate diversion programs for, for my own clients, uh, you know, who, who, who suffer from, from mental illness, I, I'm frequently hit with, with pushback from people who, who have stated simply, you know, I don't believe that diversion programs work. Um, do, do you believe that's true? If, 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 do you believe that they need help? What can we do to, 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 to make them work? Well, my experience, my subjective experience, I've been doing this for years, you know, placing uh, the mentally ill into uh, treatment programs, it is effective. Now, a very very high percentage of them succeed and don't come back into the system. Unfortunately, there are others that reoffend, and we see again and again. And those reoffenders are the ones that t take a great deal of our time. But my experience is, my observation is, these programs are effective and they keep people from getting themselves back into the criminal justice system. And they seem to be economically prudent as well. They seem to be saving taxpayers money as well. Oh, much like cheaper, win. much cheaper. The money <laughs> that the, the county would spend on, on creating 3,000 mental health hospital beds in the county jail system could be much better spent uh, on treatment programs and, and accommodate far larger number of mentally ill people in treatment. I'm not saying that we don't need some uh, mental health beds in the county jail system because there are some of mentally ill f offenders who are dangerous, who are, are incorrigible, who are difficult to handle, and need to be locked up while they're getting mental health treatment. But they're a minority. Okay, and and these, there's no reason why these programs couldn't be uh, tiered and stacked and stacked together. I mean, if, if someone is not convicted until until they're sentenced, in theory, uh, someone could could. Be given a diversion program and and try to go out and get, and, and get uh, you know uh, and get the help that they need on their own and, and and get the programs that they need by their own and if that doesn't work they could be sentenced and and could they then be put on probation or would they automatically be uh, be incarcerated? Well, it depends on what what offense they're accused of, or what they're convicted of, you know. But that this tiered approach that you're describing is used with drug offenders. I mean, a first time drug offender gets Diversion, meaning case gets dismissed or the person completes the drug treatment. A second offender gets what's called Prop 36, Prop 36 treatment, which is uh, a different level of treatment that, and where, where people are protected from being incarcerated. And then beyond that, people that keep reoffending, and then they're typically put on probation, regular probation with treatment. And, and so there are tiers to this. In fact, there are some drug treatment programs in the state prison system for those who have been immune to treatment uh, on the streets. Now, why, why, do, why do you think that there are uh, legislatively enacted diversion programs uh, for drug offenders but, but, but not for mentally ill? And what can we do to change that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the reason is. I, I think that, <clears throat> that there, there's been a, a limited awareness of uh, the, the scope of this mental health problem. Uh, the, the awareness is increasing dramatically, though, in recent years, uh, and more and more people are aware of the fact that we need to deal with this in, in a sensible, civilized way. Uh, Do you think it might be because there's a? Uh, I, I tend to. I, I think that maybe is there a stigma, uh, such a stigma associated with mental illness uh, that's not associated with a physical illness that, that keeps it out of the public dialogue, or it's just a question that I have. I, I just wonder why people, why there's not more legislative action to fix this problem, not even from an empathetic level, but from a from a from an economic and societal yeah, safety I, level. I think I think that I think that's correct. It's been there's a stigma. It's also been a problem we've swept under the rug uh, when the state years ago closed all the mental hospitals and release the mentally ill to the streets, uh, that was all fine and well, uh, except that uh, there was no <laughs> I have a feeling that was place a to, help, to help those people. And so instead they were just cut loose, and now we have an enormous homeless population, which is very visible. And the homeless populations remind us of the scope of this uh, this mental health issue we've got. 
And the homeless po uh, population, they're also pretty cut out from resources, even government, you know, government living subsidies. I mean, it, it, these tend to be people who don't have the capacity to, to, for, to uh, the administrative skills to, to get what limited benefits may be available to them. Well, I think that's true. And, and by the way, um, you know, not all homeless people are mentally ill, but I think the rule of thumb is that you know, about half the, mental, the homeless population is mentally ill. About half. That's, that is a yeah. That, that's that's a substan that's a substantial number. It um, sure is. Okay, well, well let me ask you just to, if, if if you can just sort of to to, to chime in and was it one of your closing thoughts? And this is a central theme that that, that I'm trying that I'm trying to promote. I, I tend to believe that there there um, from the bench there is compassion uh, embedded in the law, but 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 but, but legislatively and and this, and certainly as people speak about the, the problem, there tends to be uh, a, a lack of of, of, of compassion. Uh, for anybody uh, who is uh, who is accused uh, of a crime, and in, be they poor, be they mentally ill, be they be they culturally uh, different, if you can, can you comment on the case, or do you have any advice as to as to what people can maybe do to, to change that? Well, I tell you, it, it, I think you're correct, but I think that things are changing rapidly. Our our, our district attorney Jackie Lacey uh, is pushing very hard to create more awareness of the mental health problem and deal and, and how to deal with it in a constructive fashion. And uh, that's very hopeful when the, the head prosecutor of a county takes that position. And uh, I think increasingly uh, the, the bench, the judges in this county are becoming aware of it. But, it, it, the, but how mental health, Ill, mental health pro problems are handled can vary courthouse to courthouse. There are pockets where they're, it's dealt with in, in a humane, sensible way. Other pockets that basically still ignore the issue. Okay. Well, hopefully, I will learn uh, and ask questions and know which for my clients know which courts are which. Uh, that's your job as a defense attorney, right? That, that is my job. That if we're not supposed to form shop, especially in the civil court construct, but we, we certainly it, it is a potentially a necessary part of practice. Your Honor. Um, uh, thank you so much, not only for being on the show, but thank you for what you wrote. Thank you for helping uh, shed light uh, on, on this condition, and, and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. Okay, please, we hope to have you back. Thanks so much. Okay. So long. Well, that was a that, that was a exceptionally exciting folks, especially for me, and I hope I hope for you as a listener. I want to talk a little bit more about the trial that's going on of these deputies uh, who've been charged uh, in the LA County Jail matter. Last week, um, during the trial, the first trial is going on. It's with six of the 21 uh, deputies uh, who were indicted, and, and one of the defendants, Defendant Stephen Le uh, Levins, stated that uh, he moved this FBI informant. Uh, at the direction of then Sheriff Lee Baca, uh, he said, "Hey, listen. I, yes, I, I moved the guy around. Yes, I might have helped in in in, uh, in in changing his name in the computer, but I didn't do that to hide him from the FBI or to get information from him. I, I did it because I was I was told to." Um, the defense seems to be arguing that the, these people were trying to impede an FBI investigation or violate civil rights, but they uh, they actually argued that, no, 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 we did this to protect this inmate from having other inmates know that he was a snitch. Uh, I think that's a weak defense. I think the uh, idea that they were simply following orders uh, is the Nuremberg defense. And uh, and, and on one hand, the, the Nuremberg defense, is, is it's not a recognized legal defense. You, you don't get, to, you don't get a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card because you say, hey, what I did, somebody told me to do, it might be sympathetic uh, and compelling to a jury. Uh, it, it could work, but but I I, I have to say I, I hope not. Um, I, I do believe that a very bare. I understand that people don't want to punish police officers for misconduct, but at the very minimum, we need to hold police officers to the same standards as those individuals that that they arrest. Otherwise. The entire system is, is, is a mockery. I want to give a special thanks out to Judge Smirling uh, for coming to the show, uh, for coming on the show, for helping us sort of understand the, the underpinnings of the criminal justice system, uh, how we, we treat the mentally ill, what needs to change. Uh, I found it very hopeful. I think that we, we actually have, have a chance at bringing not only this, this dialogue into the public dialogue, but also finding a way uh, to better their lives and, and make us safer uh, along the line. So we're going to close out our show right now. Special thanks to Judge uh, Smirling for that. Uh, big props out to my producers in New York, Mark Goldman and, and Ryan McCormick. Listen, I, I want to hear your thoughts. So you have thoughts on today's show. If you have thoughts in the future, please email me at change at renovatejustice.com. 
You can also go ahead and follow my blog at renovatejustice.com, uh, and that's talking about the blog of what we do as far as judicial reform and criminal justice reform, or my blog at trialfiend.com. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for being here today. Please keep remembering. Let's, uh, let's keep using our heads. Let's stop using our hate. Thank you so much, and I'll see you again soon.